the last topic we're going to discuss is, is a pretty hot topic today. Um, and it's arisen in the last few years. And it's known, goes by the name of uh, double descent. And uh, just to set the stage, so with neural networks, it seems that it's better to have too many hidden units than too few. Likewise, more hidden layers seem better than few. Run in stochastic gradient descent till zero training error often gives good out of sample error. In fact, in many of these networks, like image where the signal to noise ratio is high, that's what's done. They just run all the way till you get zero training error. And number of parameters in these networks are enormous. Increasing the number of units or layers and again training till zero error sometimes give even better out of sample error. So all this sort of lays out the fact that it seems like neural networks are reluctant to overfit and you could put as many parameters as you like in the model. So what happened to overfitting and the usual variance, uh, a bias variance trade-off? And so this is set off a, a firestorm of papers and research. And one of the original papers is, is referenced here. And the title is Reconciling Modern Machine Learning and the Bias Variance Trade-Off. Basically, the message is from these papers and this research is that the bias variance trade-off is all wrong in, right. in modern settings. Right. We've had people talk about both of our books and the, the U-shaped uh, error curve for test error and saying, saying it's wrong. That's, that, that doesn't apply to neural networks. Let's see. So Rob and I and, and, and others have, have worked on this, and, uh, and that's why we've added a section in the book on double descent, double descent, because many people have now heard of it, and we want to give our point of view. And to do that, we're going to do a little simulation, which is often simulations are helpful for understanding phenomena. So this is very simple. We have, we're going to generate data from a sine curve. Um, and the feature X is going to be uniformly distributed on minus 5 to 5. And the error is going to be Gaussian with standard deviation 0.3. So you can do the simulation yourself. We have a small training set of size 20. And we have a very large test set. And by the way, if you do a simulation, there's no value in having a small test set. Make it really large. You want to find out exactly what the test error is. So we're going to fit a natural spline to the data. And if, if you've forgotten about natural splines, these, these are in section 7.4 of the book. And it's a way of fitting a flexible function. And there's lectures as well on natural splines in the series. And we're going to fit with d degrees of freedom. So it's going to be, that, what that means is you're going to be fitting a linear regression onto d basis functions. So your prediction is going to be of the form, a linear combination of these these basis functions with d parameters. And what we're going to change is d. So we're going to enrich this basis by increasing d and see what happens. So when d is 20, you're going to have exactly the same number of features as you've got training observations, right? And because these basis functions are all different, you're going to fit the training data exactly. And, and all the residuals are going to equal to zero. But now we're going to even go further. We're going to let d get bigger than 20. So we need to say what we're going to do there. Well, what we do is when d is bigger than 20, you can still get zero residual solutions, but they're not going to be unique. At exactly 20, you'll get a single solution. But when d is bigger than 20, there's infinitely many solutions with zero residual. So you've got to pick amongst them. So among the zero residual solutions, we'll pick the one with what's known as minimum norm, i.e. the zero residual solution with the smallest value of sum of squares of beta j squared. And we'll see why that, how that plays a role. And we'll also explain in a little while why we set up this particular simulation in this kind. So here's the result, and this shows the double descent curve. So in this picture, we show on the horizontal axis, the degrees of freedom, or d, as we add basis functions. In the vertical axis, we show the, the error. The test error is in blue, and the training error is in orange. So sure enough, you can see the training error, that's over the 20 observations. As d increases, it drops and drops and drops. And at d equals 20, it hits 0. And then, of course, thereafter, it's 0. And the, the degrees of freedom we're showing on the log scale, 
And so you can see things get compressed up here. The test error is what is interesting here. The test error initially drops and then starts increasing as we start overfitting the training data. And this part shows the usual bias variance trade-off, right? Initially, error is high because of bias, drops down, and then error starts increasing because of variance, and it literally shoots through the ceiling here. But then something interesting happens. The error starts decreasing again, and so this is the double descent. And it starts decreasing, reaches a minimum, and then it seems like it starts increasing again. So what happens as D increases above 20 is the sum of squares of the coefficients, even though they're more coefficients, the sum of squares decreases because we have more opportunities to fit the data exactly. And so we can find a configuration of betas that have a smaller sum of squares. So let's say we go from D is 25 to D is 40, right? One candidate is the solution we got at D equals uh, 25. But we've got lots of other candidates because we've got 40, and we could set the remaining ones to zero. So that's a candidate. So we can only do better in, if we're trying to minimize the sum of squares of the betas, having more betas to do it. And it turns out that what that does is by making the sum of squares of the beta small, that means all the betas are getting smaller, um, we're going to have less wiggly solutions. They're getting smaller, and I guess they're being spread out over more functions, right? And sp yeah, yeah, spread out over more functions. And so this picture shows what's happening. So here's eight degrees of freedom, which, let's see, eight degrees of freedom, that's around here. That's a pretty good solution. That's about as, as good as we get, right? And you can see it's getting a nice approximating solution. Here's 20 degrees of freedom. This is the one, you know, so what we're showing here is the true sine wave, the actual data points, 20 data points. And we're showing the fitted curve. And we're showing the fitted curve everywhere. So at 20, of course, the fitted curve has to go through every data point, which it does, the observed data points. But what you see is in order to do that with exactly 20 degrees of freedom, it has to really stretch itself and the function goes shooting off in all different places elsewhere because the loss is only concerned with the training data. Right? So it really has to stretch itself to, to, to fit the data exactly. But when you go to 42 degrees of freedom, for example, which is where we achieve the minimum to the right of the, the 20 point, you can see the functions much better behave. These departures, it's a much smoother function. It's still making little jumps in that, but nothing nearly as severe as that. And that's because all these Ds are smaller. And likewise, you go up to 80, not too much has, has changed over there. Okay. So that's an explanation for what's going on in, in this little example. So here's some facts. So in a wide linear model, in other words, P is much bigger than N, and you fit by least squares using stochastic gradient descent with a small step size, and you keep on going, that leads to a minimum norm residual solution. So this ties stochastic gradient descent and, and going all the way to the solution, to the minimum, a zero residual solution, it actually gets the minimum norm solution, right, with a minimum sum of squares of the betas and stochastic gradient descent used in the neural network. So by analogy, by training slowly to zero residual, you get in a more regularized solution. Another way of, of talking about this is stochastic gradient flow, i.e. the entire path of stochastic gradient descent solutions is somewhat similar to the ridge path. So the ridge path is a sequence of solutions you get when you slowly vary the ridge regularization parameter, that's called the ridge path of solutions. And this, the stochastic gradient flow is a, a sequence of solutions you get as you go down gradient descent. They're quite similar. Not exactly, but quite. So by analogy, deep and wide neural networks fit by stochastic gradient descent down to zero training error often give good solutions that generalize well. And in particular cases with high signal to noise ratio, e.g. image recognition, 
are less prone to overfitting the, the zero error solutions in, in, and is mostly a signal. The zero error solution is mostly a signal. Okay, so that's that's uh, the that little discussion on, on on double descent. So we'll end up this just talking a bit about software. There's wonderful software available for neural networks and, and deep learning. So TensorFlow from Google and PyTorch from Facebook and, and, and both are Python packages. So in the chapter 10 lab, we demonstrate TensorFlow and a Keras package in R which interface to, Py to the Python versions of these packages. And so you can see the, the text book and online resources for, for R Markdown and Jupyter notebooks for these and all the labs in the second edition of the book. And there's a Torch package in R, which is, it, which is available as well. And it impl implements the PyTorch um, version of a dialect for fitting neural networks. And the chapter 10 lab will be available in, the, in this dialect as well. So if you watch the resource page at, at www.statlearning.com.